I want to thank everyone for, for being here. And I'm just wondering how many out there are home growers? How many of you are planting seeds? All right, great. Well, thank you for coming. Really excited you could be here today. Well, we're being joined by Nick from Green Source Gardens. Welcome. And we have Daniel here from Heart Rock Mountain. And Forrest is joining us from Covalo. Sunroots Farm. Sunroots. Sunroots Farm. In Covalo. Covalo. In, in Covalo. Nice. So I'd like to just know a little bit about your, from each one of you, just a brief introduction about your farm, about the size of your farm, a little bit about what you have growing there, and a little bit also with that, your, your genetics program. Okay, um, well, I'm Nick from Green Source Gardens. Um, we are up in just outside of Wolf Creek, uh, Oregon, Southern Oregon. Um, we're in the the like foothills that begin the makings of the Cascades. So um, the southwest beginning foothills of the Cascades, I guess. They're mountains, but they're definitely smaller. Um, we live on a mountain that is called Post Mountain. We're at 22,000 feet and 42 degrees latitude and the mountain that I live on is really close to a really big mountain in the area that affects the climate in a wetter way. We're on the wet side of that mountain. Um, full sun, southern slope uh, on this mountain called Post Mountain, hidden from the agricultural lands which is nice for breeding purposes. Um, and, and we grow all kinds of stuff. Uh, we are really interested in naturalized perennials, things that don't take a whole lot of effort, and integrating those kinds of plant cultures into production gardens is the way I believe we increase the water infiltration. And so that's a big thing that we're doing there, uh, is, is working on the increased water infiltration of the upper watershed. Um, and then from a genetic standpoint, cannabis wise, uh, I've been collecting a lot of genetics over the years and every year I make a lot of seeds. And so, you know, over the, and I, I grow all from seed. So even for the production commercial organ market, uh, we, I grow everything from seed uh, and and so I've had to really dive deep into that process and how to make that available to the market in a way that the market would receive it well. And so that's just taken me on a journey of kind of specializing seeds and directions of all different types, but really looking at acclimating seeds through that process as well as finding the dank that is easy to move on the market um, and has to be that way at this point because it's super squeezed up there in Oregon. There's a lot of producers and a lot of retailers and not that many people. Um, so that's kind of the gist in terms of projects. I mean, we, maybe we get into that later. Uh, I have so many different directions and, and, and ways that I'm going that I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Nick. I'm Daniel and I'm in Heart, Heart Rock Mountain Farm and we're in uh, Potter Valley. Um, I was born on that farm. Uh, my dad started growing there in 77. He did a crop before that in Santa Cruz in 76, and uh, 10 years before that, in 1966, he, he kept his first seeds that he found in the bottom of a bag. Um, you know, now we have a 10,000 square foot cultivation license. We have a nursery license that we've been doing um, for two years. We use it just for seed production. It's fun. I, I grew over 600 photo period plants that were three foot to six foot tall for seed production this year and the year before. You know, we have over 350 seed lots and, you know, five, five auto flowers and uh, it's, you know, I'm a bit of a crazy person because I just keep making more, you know. Um, and just heritage strains that, you know, we, and then we interbreed them with designer genetics and 
just keep playing around. Hi, my name is Forrest. Uh, I'm born and raised in Covalo, California in the mountains. And now I have a 10 acre farm in uh, the valley. Uh, we have animals and fruit trees and all sorts of other things growing on the farm. Uh, we, uh, the varieties that we grow are passed down from our, my family for a while and they've been climatized to the region and we grow really big plants that uh, in full sun that, you know, just showing their full expression each year throughout the season, so. Those are some big plants you grow. What, what were you saying, 20 pound plant, really? Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. We, gotta, we grow some Mark. big plants in Covalo, not just my farm, but like a lot of farms around me. Um, yeah. Um, can you just, I, I wouldn't mind growing one of these big plants. Can you just give, and for these home growers out there, I mean, come on, six 20 pound plants. Okay, let's hear it. Just a little, some tips on how to grow some big plants. Yeah. It's all about timing, uh, having really good seed. If, uh, it's all uh, 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 really like the first thing that you have to really think about, you know, what, what are you growing? What are you growing for? Um, and do then- you, Do you brace them at all or? What's that? Do you use braces or like kind of- Oh yeah, you, I like, triple cage them? my plants throughout the growing season. You have to or else, you know, the wind will pick up and take your whole plant down. So. I, uh, when they're small, I put a little small cage, and then as soon as, uh, you know, they start growing, I'll put four fence posts around and put another seven-foot cage two feet up, you know, so they have... Do they take a lot, I mean, you'd think to grow a plant that big, it must use a lot of water, is that what you found, or...? We're really blessed where we are. We have a huge aquifer underneath the valley and um, the well that the wells that we use, uh, they're only 50 feet deep, right into like some really sweet water. I can just pump them all day and it, whatever they, the plants don't use, it just goes right back into the water table. So I don't really feel bad about overusing water. And the way we, uh, we water our plants, we, uh, we use little spaghetti tubes every foot. So there's dry spots and wet spots. So the plant takes what, they, what it wants, what it needs and you know. Do you breed for big plants too? Oh, absolutely. I, I want big plants. I, I really enjoy growing, you know, full, full season and seeing how big they get, you know. Um, my brothers like to grow big plants too, so it's really nice to like, <laughs> we're a little competitive family, so uh, it, it <laughs> who grew the biggest plant this year? <laughs> Speaking of that, you know, your family's pretty prolific and known in, in the area, but maybe talk about some of the genetics that have uh, come through you and your family. The, uh, the jaw goo, that's one of my brother Mike's uh, strains that he crossed over 15 years ago. Collaborated with his good friend Noel. Um, probably a lot of people know Noel here. Uh, but, you know, since then we've just been taking those seeds and I've been just breeding what I like into them. Like, you know, the, I like a Skywalker goo. I cross that with the goo, and now I have a Skywalker goo. And then there's the, the, the velvet perps that I grow. I've gro crossed that into a lot of the other ones that I grow now. So it's just really fun to see what comes out of, you know, what comes out of all the seeds, because you never really know. It's so much fun to see what comes out of all the seeds. One of the coolest thing about doing the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award and doing the site visits is like getting to connect with people on all the different levels from the, the soil building, but the, the genetic aspect like, well, gets me really excited. I've been obsessive you know, for 20 years on this. And uh, yeah, to see the work that you're doing for a very specific thing, you know, what's your, what's your, what do you want for your outcome is always interesting, like working backwards and you want monster plants and you're in the perfect place to do it and you have the perfect water source to do it. And like these, these are legitimately 20 pound plants. I've seen them. Normally I'd be like, bullshit, you know how big a 10 pound plant is? And like, and, uh, and the flowers are flawless all the way through too. But like, there's a lot of selection work going on to, to make that happen. And what I really love too is seeing the genetic sharing, like, and then like that cultural sharing, the background stories of these different genetics and how they came to different places. And the first time I met Nick, uh, 
I was with my buddy Ryan who does Humboldt Seed Organization as well and we gave him some seeds, some black dog and some cherry, uh, sorry, uh, glazed cherries. And um, you know, he's, he's made like five F generations off of those as well as amazing back crosses and I get to see, and even those two combined as well as all kinds of things. So I get to see you know, stuff from so long ago turn into all these other things and every year we you know, exchange a few other things and get to see cool things and we just did the same. Um, but I love seeing the, the sharing between everyone and like uh, Daniel as well, just tons of people's stuff all put together and I see your stuff like at Moongazer and all over the place. Like it's, it, it's just really cool to see the sharing between the regen farms when it comes to the genetics as well as all the information. But um, Nick, do you want to tell maybe some stories on some crosses and uh, that kind of sharing? Oh yeah, oh. maybe a little bit about your, the, that, that amazing, that pink, well, what's that? Pinkleberry. Didn't that a originate from Covalo originally? I, yeah, originally most of my backbone genetics come from Covalo. Um, so definitely. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, now kind of some of the things I focus on, so there's this glazed cherries that I get that's just like the dank, you know, and, and we all know what the dank is. It's like, that's why it's so good these days is because everybody who grows has an eye for the dank and the dank could mean many things, but generally it involves a lot of resin and a lot of nose. Um, and it's always that special one and those are the selections we as breeders are always hunting to make. And, um, but what I'm trying to do now is, is understand kind of the technical uh, components of breeding. I grew a lot of vegetables and I still do, but I really just do it for the homestead and, and for my community and sharing and not selling vegetables anymore. Um, and, and focusing specifically, you know, my work on, on the cannabis. But, I, you know, we have inbred lines, we have F1s, and we have uh, polyhybrids. And to understand these different terminology is really important for a breeder, right? So I grow all from seed, so I'm really interested in, in uh, uniformity. Not so much, I've never grown a clone, so I'm obviously not that interested in it. Um, however, um, there is some benefits to having some uniformity, and as I go further with breeding, I'm, I look into this stuff, and I do some research, and I try to understand, you know, how come the catalogs that you buy your vegetables from our F1s and, and then they're super uniform and they have their own name. Um, and the reason that is, is there's a technical way to go about that process. And in cannabis, you get an F1 and it might express wildly and it's, then it's not really an F1. So it's like, we have to start understanding these, the language and how we're saying, here's this, it's, it's an F1, even though both cuts that were used to make it were both polyhybrids, not really an F1, so you're not going to get that uniformity. So I've been working on trying to stabilize and inbreed further lines, and that just means generationally sibling crossing these plants with the selections that I make to further the whatever it was called when I got it and whether it was truly what it was when I got it or not it's hard to say in this culture um, however the further we do continue to inbreed those lines and then use those inbred lines as our breeding stock to create commercial production lines that are more about uh, hybrid vigor that's when you know we're coming into like okay I want to grow all from seed well I want to grow F1s if I'm a doing this for the market just because it's from a business standpoint the most efficient from seed type of seed to be running in your production field but I need to maintain these inbred lines and of as many varieties as possible um, so that I can continue to create new F1s and now those F1s become the things that you name and then you have a lot of work to stabilize that new variety into its own breeding stock so you might change the name of something with a uh, F1 cross in order to, uh, because the further inbred you go, the more predictable the traits in which you're breeding with become. And so two inbred lines that are stable, and I don't even really work with deeply inbred lines. I'm talking F4, F5, F6, and I only grow outdoor, and I don't use light manipulation, so I'm not running multiple generations in a year and hurrying that process along. Um, but the further inbred you go, the more reliable, real F1 you get. So I think in agri agriculture, it's like you go to F9 before you create an F1. 
And so you go to F9 with two very different things, and that cross of those two F9s becomes a new variety that's an F1. And now you could stabilize that and make that a different variety, but how many generations you got to go? A bunch. To yeah, like F9 it. in agriculture. So I just want to share this information as I learn it in the process, help you guys understand what you're looking at when you see these, and ask your breeders more in-depth questions about what are you talking about when you say back cross? I'm trying to get to the bottom of this, you know? Like, what does that mean? It seems to mean something different to everybody. So, so. How, how, many, how many plants are you talking about? Like, to, when you're going back, like, how many plants do you, how many seeds are you planting, and how many plants are you looking at to kind of make these determinations from? So, you know, I'm not working with huge populations, but I have a 20,000 square foot uh, production canopy and I pop about a hundred seeds per variety each year. That's a pretty good sift as far as I'm concerned in comparison to what yeah, it has been. Yeah, and also in, in terms of just observing and what you can see. I have a, um, a question for Daniel uh, as we're talking about this and that is is the intuitive side. And now we could just run a bunch of numbers and and and, and also go that route but then there's also just luck. There's just the intuitive side of Okay, it's it's there. It's going to show itself, and I'm curious how how you work with intuition in breeding. Well, you know, and it's also because my older brother was the numbers guy, and he re he read every book there was, and and he knew like, okay, I'm going to take this, I'm going to cross it with that, I'm going to get this, I'm going to bring out this trait, and I'm just like, what do you want to be pollinated with plant? And you know, <laughs> but but like Nick, I'm learning the science now, you know. And uh, it's, it's fun, and, um, but I've always considered myself to be a, a plant whisperer. So if you're the science people out there, learn how to talk to the plants. And you know, if you're the plant people, you know, learn the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, in legal, in we, so we, we've been just making seeds, but it was like a branch or two. You know, we were harvesting pollen maybe from eight males, you know, pre-legalization, and now it's 50 different males, multiple plants, 75 different males. And, you know, but I only see maybe 10% of, you know, growing out 10 to 40 plants per seed lot and finding one or two out of those that is worthy of pollen. Yeah, because each, each year when you back cross, you, it, the expression is a little different. And so one thing is just librarying and holding on to some because then a few years down the road, you're like, God, you know, that one year, that was the year that was really good. And thank goodness I got some seeds. I can go back and, and plant those again. Well, yeah, that was, you know, uh, in taking your lines different ways. So if you get down here to F6 and it's not good, you have a couple other options to work with, especially if it's something, you know, special that you like, you might want to try. What about, directions. there are so many things that we could be crossing all the time. And maybe, like, how do you stay focused? <laughs> um, I don't know, I just go for it, you know? But it's also, you know, like uh, Kelly from Dragonfly Earth Medicine, she uses her, like, dowsing rod over the, or the pendulum over the seeds, but... Um, I'm just hoping actually to get more space so I, you know, don't have to pick and choose. I can just start them all. You want to, um, Dan really goes for it, by the way. Like, <laughs> I was walking through the, those plants. It's like, there's so much variety. There's so much. It's like hard to, like, fully take it in. And I'm a total whirlwind with all that insanity, and too. And I have like, an exceptional memory, yeah. I, I, like an elephant. So well, that, that proper helps. labeling is really important. So, like, when you realize there's something, like, from four years ago, and you just had those right numbers oh, and letters yeah, on there to know that it was the one that you're looking at you later. You can't have any doubt. Label, oh, label, label. One mishap on a label. Oh, yeah, I'm starting to map out the family tree as it, you know, before it gets away from me. Yeah. <laughs> Forrest, do you want to answer to, or respond to the question as well? Uh, so my breeding, I, I don't do it very scientific either. Um, it's more of just what I like in the garden, and I kind of just go with my gut and uh, see where it leads me. And it's so far, it's it's been uh, it's worked out. <laughs> well, I mean, but, yeah, and just like, and, and I I don't crack so many seeds every year. I, the most I crack is probably like 500. So. Um, and I usually don't even plant that many because I don't need that many. Um, so my breeding isn't as vast, but 
I still have a lot of good stuff to breed with, so I, I just go with what I feel, really. <laughs> and, and for you, Nick, how do you find that balance between in, intuition and numbers? I think they're both extremely valid, and we all probably have started from more of an intuitive place in just, like, selecting the dank. Um, there's no way a single breeder would, like, walk around and be like, look at that crazy resin monster and be like, nah. <laughs> So, you know, that, that's the intuitive piece is like, we all know what that is. Um, if we've been growing, you, you'll know. If you haven't grown, you should grow some and you'll see one that stands out and you'll be like, well, that's the one. And that's what we make seeds with or that's what we'll focus on really elite lines. And maybe that's what the elite line is. You, you pop 40, four of them are amazing. Those are your elite lines. You're gonna wanna make seed with those. I've just been doing that for a while now, so like from seed I could pretty reliably get a pretty, and I've got, I can get just good numbers, I can, you know, and the COAs have been helpful for that. So like this whole marrying science and intuition, it's really, and like Daniel said, you know, if you're super scientific, you should focus on balancing that, and if you're super intuitive, you should focus on balancing that, because somewhere in the middle is where the real magic really starts to come together because even as I've gotten more, say, into the language and terminology of, of breeding, um, it's really made a difference from how I'm doing it. So it's like, you know, uh, it, I am a production farmer and I do provide for the market. So there is a certain pressure of test results maintaining a certain level. Well, if I get a multi pheno batch tested, I get a good understanding of the potency of that genetic. I might not know what every single plant is in terms of its quantity of cannabinoids completely, but I know that within that genetic, I'm seeing this, this range of, of potency. Um, and, and then there's this important component where you gotta work with the ones that aren't that dank but have unique characteristics because those are the ones that you're gonna wanna take and work with those really elite things to bring new, completely new expressions around. And so if you're buying IBLs or inbred lines for your seed stock, just understand those are probably bottlenecked pretty good and have gone in a less vigorous direction, but they're probably more uniform and stable to some extent across the board. But don't expect as much from them. And if you really want to be expecting commercial viable uh, uniformity that act similarly to each other and have similar structure, then um, look at the F1s. And, and that's just in, in general how agriculture has been working. So um, open pollinated varieties and F1s are what you see in seed, seed catalogs. If you see, nobody sees F2, F3, F4 on beets. Um, that's not something that generally gets brought to market. That's something that's being worked into something that ends up bringing to market. Cannabis right now, polyhybrids though, are really important. If you're just growing to find an elite cut that you wanna just keep as a clone, get polyhybrids, and they should be cheaper. People aren't working that hard, unless they really have put time into some, but I'm like, if it's a polyhybrid or a double polyhybrid, or there's multiple parents on one side, and multiple on the other, like, unless you were the one that created those parents, you didn't do that much work to make it because any of us can buy some seed from you and some seed from you and then mix them and make some incredible cannabis and we should all be doing that. That's, our, that's really seed preservation work, is a lot of people doing that. We can sort it all out any time in the future if we have the seeds. Um, that's the work that we can go further into doing. So I just encourage everybody to buy seeds, grow seeds, and make seeds, and then our future should be more secure. Yeah. It's, it's really cool, just one of the things is there's, now that we've entered this age of commercial cannabis, there's kind of this wanting to just hold on to what you have and not share it and whatnot. And this culture of sharing that we have is important. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are moving into the future, into this just into capitalism and, and also we're sharing, but then also how do we balance sharing as well as making a profit? 
Well, that, you know, it's interesting in the cannabis industry now, you know, people go, oh, big business and cannabis, what a shame. I'm like, no, big business, what a shame. You know, the whole, the whole world over, and you know, we're, we're definitely like on the brink of destruction because of predatory capitalism. Um, but, you know, sharing seeds with your friends and, and selling your best seeds to the community, you know, that you're gonna take something and go a totally different way than I'm gonna take something. And, you know, it's, there's so much uh, creativity within a seed that you can really go any direction with it. Yeah, I feel the same. Yeah, I really, I really feel like sharing is the direction that we need to go, you know? Like, um, I just got some seeds from um, BioVortex, and then I just crossed them and gave them back, you know? Now I, now he, Great he's names, got, too. He's got... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he gave me the Voltron, and then I crossed it with my Velvet Perps, and now he's got Velvetron. Velvetron. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And well, we're all stoked, so... Oh, both, both Voltron <laughs> and Velvetron are in the calendar. I mean, and... Uh, that's, there's Velvet Perps. Grown by Velvet Sun. Perps. Grown, and then uh, there's Voltron. There you go. Grown by High Water Farms, Dry <laughs> Farms, too. Really Full nice. circle. <laughs> the sharing is also important because I've heard stories from other farmers of how they've lost genetics because they did not share them. And then years down, they come back later and they're like, wow, you've been growing this for all these years? Oh my God, there's that genetic that I, I, I thought I lost. And so those are... Those are some pretty, yeah, that's, it's good, it's good to share and follow your heart and find partners with that, that you all, that you share the same values. In, in California, on production scale of it, I can't make enough of one cultivator to make a difference, you know, and I got some velvet perp seeds from Forrest, and I'm going to grow a batch of it out for production, and it's not going to mess with his bottom line at all. It's going to help him get his name out there, because I'll give him credit for it, and you know, then, and I cross that with my autoflower genetics, and I'm going to be happy the day I can hand them back and, uh, an autoflower velvet perps. <laughs> so, hold on, I want to just jump on that, just because of the question. Uh, it was just that, this whole weird place where it's like valuing your work, being supported, and sharing, and... and and then the fear that comes in that people have about, oh, if my seat ends up here. Blah, blah. I'm like, if, if somebody's supporting you um, by, by purchasing it and they take your seeds and make more seeds with it, that's like the biggest honor. So, um, you know, we should all be doing that and nobody owns it. Like, I'm tired of this, like, greedy eyeballs over genetics. Like, um, but at the same time, we need to value the genetics that are, take, that are being given all this work. And so we have to understand how to support that process, too, because, you know, not everybody's as obsessed, maybe, as some of us up here around how much time we spend with pollen. So um, there's a lot of tricks around that, too, um, and, and all the techniques uh, to maintain less pollen drift and to still have a viable crop within a production zone for the market. You know, all this stuff comes into consideration as you're breeding and you realize it like, wow, man, there's a few seeds over here, whoops. You know, it happens, but I've never gotten a single complaint in the market. Everybody's only giving me positive feedback when they found seeds, but <laughs> nobody owns the seeds. We just take care of them and help them, but the power is through nature. That's what designed them, that's what created them, and we're just here to help them along, so. And, this <laughs> and the seeds, too, they're not in track and trace. So share them, um, <laughs> your home growers. You can have your seed production going on as home growers and sharing amongst yourselves. So yeah, there's, the seeds are there, they're free. So in the regenerative cannabis calendar that we do, um, I get to feature all these farms and get different information from them too. I share my own, but Nick wrote this really cool thing on regenerative breeding points. But the, the quote we have here is, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Just the potential inside of seeds is so amazing. The value that comes out of a seed blows me away. To see something you worked on years ago all over the world and 
to see it on beautiful farms with polyculture and to see that sharing with other people. Um, it's one of my favorite things. It warms my heart as an artist and a human. Um, but I, I wanted you to read these regenerative points, if you could, because they're really, really thoughtful, and I appreciate you putting that together. Yeah, so this is just... When I think the term regenerative breeding, I'm like, what is... That's such an interesting term, right? Like, we're all trying to figure out what that is, and we all realize we're striving for regenerative and not really there yet. As a culture, as a people, we've got a few generations before we end up in this regenerative space that we all want to be in, just based on the infrastructure of society and capitalism. And if you get involved in selling things, you got packaging trail that's pretty long and pretty much offsets all your potential regenerative qualities. <laughs> but... Um, regenerative breeding points, I say grow plants in the natural light cycle. Um, that's all I do. I don't manipulate the light. I don't, you don't have to start them inside under lights. Wait until April. They want to wake up later. If they don't start outside, it's because it's too cold. You manipulate their light cycle, you don't know what they do naturally. So for me, regenerative is about natural processes. So I'm only real, really interested in how they work naturally with the, with the earth um, and my climate. And, and I just give myself to that whole process. And even though it's hard and not everything works, it's worth it. Um, so when they were talking regenerative, yeah, is that the best technique in the world for specific things? Maybe not, but we're talking regenerative. Um, make intentional breeding selections by setting goals for desired outcomes like mold and disease resistance, structure, color, aroma. Have a goal. If you're breeding, have some kind of goal, you know? It might be to make polyhybrids and then you don't need to be that specific. You meet your goal, you might make another goal and at some point it changes. And so just as long as you have a direction you're going, you can at least be making a selection that's not just like, uh, I think this one, you know? Um, use multiple males when collecting pollen to strengthen the gene pool. You know, this is important in the long-term seed making of inbred lines especially. Many. Uh, many males gives you some more genetic diversity. And after you've bottlenecked, you want to try to, which is just reducing to say one male, one female, you might start selecting more males and you might start selecting similar looking males, but more males is better than fewer. So increasing that male population as it's possible. The legality of all this cannabis stuff puts a lot of restrictions on our methodology in terms of what we can, at, can and can't do. So. You know, I wish I could save a lot more males than I do, but such is the case, some, someday. Um, I say pollinate feel females mid-August to mid-September. Getting past mid-September, you're starting to run into that moldy time. So seeds aren't going to mature before they start molding, so you just have less viable seeds. Now, you could still get some seeds, and for a home scale, that's great. But if you're wanting to make seeds, you got to pollinate that with like five to, you, you want five to six weeks of post-pollination development. Um, if you don't have that, then you just end up with a bunch of immature seeds. And if you pollinate too late, you have a bunch of seeds on the outside of the bud that are immature. Not ideal. It always sucks when you're cleaning seeds and only three or four of the thousand you made are good. We've probably all done it. I have. Lower south-facing branches tend to be the best. I mean, just full sun, best conditions less mold in the north side of the plant and the seeds make the buds tighter when they're really well seeded. So you run into more mold on seeded branches and so keeping those in the, the more sunlight is going to be a better place to get more seeds. Um, clean seed and low, oh this is important, so when you're packing your seeds or making seeds for packs and you're, you're just saving seeds, you know, manage your climate. Low humidity. If you pack up a bunch of seeds in 85% humidity, they're probably not going to be viable for very long because they're trapped in some plastic or something that doesn't breathe, and the humidity is too high in there. So just make it a point to run your dehumidifier when you're packaging your seeds so that when you package them and put them in that sealed container, those things are good when they open up. Um, a, a point to that, too, if you're using glass and you're refrigerating or freezing it, like you make, need to make sure that that container comes to room temperature and that room is dry before you open it because it will just suck all that moisture in. Same is true with flowers and hash, too, but just be mindful of it coming to room temperature and it being low humidity when you open it. Yeah, pull your seed, if you store them in the fridge, which I do, store, pull them out and let them sit for five hours. 
Actually, keeping a dehum on before you even open the fridge is good too, so no moisture goes in when you open the door. And then, uh, final, just like you want to store your seeds for long term viability. One, make sure they were packaged or they're stored in low humidity, and then uh, they'll remain that way for a long time. Cool temperatures are great. You can freeze, not a big deal. I wouldn't be getting in the practice of freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing too much, um, but it, it's, freezing is probably the longest term if you wanted to put like, I want this seed bank to be available in 50 years, it'll likely be just fine after 50 years if it was put in the freezer dry. Now for me, I'm mostly storing most of my seeds just in a refrigerator um, and making sure that they were packaged right before they go in there. So, and I've changed my packaging over the years and been playing with that. But that and then I, the final tip is just breed every year. It's really important because right now the climate is changing rapidly. There's a lot of information that comes to the seeds every season. If you just like keep one seed stock and are always working off of that, that's fine, you might find, but man, what about the evolution of cannabis? That's what I'm really interested in. I rarely am jumping back into my old banks and being like, man, I'm gonna go back and hit that. I'm like way more excited about all these projects and all the information that came with the season that's wrapped up in that seed. And then that's the medicine when we smoke gives us the information that we need from the planet in current time. So we're trying to get our updates from our plants uh, as, as evolved as possible, and especially with the cl changing climate, to continue that evolution as much as we can. So that's some breeding. That's point. fantastic, yeah. And a good joint's a great tool for breeding too, <laughs> just knowing the flavor and the effects. Oh, in a, a spray bottle, a spray bottle for pollen collectors. You spray yourself off if you're messing with pollen because I'll be in and out of the garden and if I don't spray myself down, then everything gets a little bit of seed. I just have one thing to add to that. We noticed, you know, going from making a branch to seeding whole plants that, you know, just like a mom with, you know, carrying a baby, they, they needed more food. And so seeds for seeds, we, um, we sprout barley or, you know, you can do sunflower, whatever you have, you know, in about two ounces of sprouted seeds, you blend it up, add, add it to five gallons of water and you feed it to your heavily seeded plants and they will mature top to the bottom quicker, um, you know, on either side of the plant and shadier parts of your farm, you know, so just give them those prenatals, you know. You want to add, add for us to that about um, just some, some techniques? I usually just uh, pollinate one branch at a time. Like I'll just select like the best plant that I like and pollinate just one little branch. So I'm not pollinating a whole, you know, big tree. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, I do want to open it up to questions from the audience. But before we do, I was going to have Daniel read us a poem. Yeah, so this is my uh, ode to Luther Burbank, who was a local Sonoma County uh, legend and you know, probably worldwide you know, plant uh, botanist, not with cannabis, but you know, he's done amazing things. And uh, this poem is called Love Shapes the World. Apart from scientific knowledge, love accelerates evolution, Luther Burbank. Do you know how he made the spineless cactus? Listen to his words and I will tell you. I often spoke to the plant to create a vibration of love. You do not need your defensive thorns, I would tell them. I will protect you. And gradually, one generation, the useful plant of the desert emerged in a thornless variety. Do you see just how love shapes the world? Someday, the future we will inherit is shaped by our collective thoughts and actions. So speak wisely, step tenderly, and love without measure. And someday, when we are kind enough, gentle enough, and every thought and action is imbued with such love, this world will drop its thorns. Are there some questions from the audience? Oh yeah, you can come to this mic here if you have a question.
Yeah, I mean, you 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 have to um, when you harvest it from the mail, you got want you want to pull out the plant matter or any bugs and and you know store it. Um, I don't like to take mine in and out of the fridge, you know, but it's only good for a couple months, and then you can freeze it, and then it's only good once, and usually only you got like 20 minutes on there, and you know, keep it not cold, and then and yeah, I used over 45 different types of uh, frozen pollen on uh, my autoflower um, project this summer. Do you, do you dry it just a little bit? I mean, yeah, it, it dries. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Because you don't, before you, and put it, I put it in jars with moisture packets because, and then, you know, you'll find out if you didn't, if it wasn't dry pretty, you know, pretty quick. Because it, it cakes gonna, up and it's no good. And it's going to mold. Uh, it, mold, it, mold. Yeah. Pollen's similar to seeds. If it's humid out, you probably don't want to collect it and, you know, and store it. But if it's dry out, you're likely going to have a better storage result. So... Also letting the pollen fall naturally from the flowers and then making sure you get the flowers out of the pollen. So um, waiting for it to drop on its own is a really important step. I mean, I know when I was really excited and starting, I would like be like, there's a flower, and I'd start milking that stuff out of there. <laughs> it's not the way to go. Growing in a wet environment, too, like you really see how the males, they, they choose their time to release just right. Like they pay attention. It's like, okay, it's about to be warm and dry. We're about to get a breeze. Oh, and like, yeah, on a just hot... paying attention to it. And a lot of times they're just like, no, we're holding on to all this pollen because it just would immediately be wasted. And on a hot day, we definitely want to be watching them. They, they will pop on a hot day. I was just wondering if there's too dry for seed storage. Is it okay to get it super duper dry? Or? I don't know if too dry. I'm always like, Dry, go dryer, dryer, but maybe you know some more about that. No, I would just go dryer, yeah. Okay. Dry. <laughs> I've never seen anything dry not be a good thing in the seed department, but I've seen moisture ruin seeds. How, how about your pollen drift just in your garden? If you're in, in the commercial market and you get some seeds in your buds, how are you separating that okay, or how is that going? Pollen drift, um, you have to be, like, if you're actually bringing your flower to shelf, there definitely needs to be a series of checks on its way into your final bag and on its way to the retailer. And that's increased for us more as we've done it longer. Um, so that's important. We, had, we do, you know, that gets caught likely in the trimming room. But the, the way to prevent that is to understand when to pollinate. And maybe that's more crucial information really is like, you're, you're pollinating, I'm pollinating in the morning in calm weather, and I used to do the evening, but I've kind of like, it seems like the mornings are nice and, and still, so that seems to be the time that I've been working with it and get away with less pollen drift. Um, I'm also, again, the spray bottle, I can't encourage and emphasize enough, just the spray bottle mentality, I'm, I'm a freak about spraying myself now because of pollen drift in the past. Is there, is there a question back there? Um, well, where my farm at in Potter Valley, you know, we're the end of a dirt road and there's a cattle ranch and the national forest and we get, you know, we're close enough to the coast where we get the prevailing westerly. So the males are way up there and the flowers are over here and, and diligence too, like, you know, and, uh, you know, you're checking your males in a hot day, you're checking them two, three times a day. And then I, I, once they open, or start to open, or right before they open, I'll cut them, jar them, and take them inside where they still get some light, and they'll finish flowering and drop a lot of pollen. And, and then I get up early in the morning, and now they got the weather apps too, so I'll, I'll get up, and I'm pollinating, the wind picks up, I check the weather app, oh, it'll be still in an hour, and sure enough, the wind stopped, or, you know, check the weather app the night before, four mile an hour winds, no thank you. Um, and then when you get on the still morning and there's no wind and you dip your paintbrush into the pollen and you can tap it, you can literally see the pollen just fall straight down on the plant and you know, it doesn't go anywhere but right there. Do you wanna, um... So we live in the valley where we do get some drift from other gardens. Um, it's kind of inevitable. So we do find some seed here and there but it's really not that big a deal. One year it was a little bit more than others, but um, most of all it's been pretty good. Um, for my pollen production, I usually just keep my males like off to the side, smaller, and then just bring them inside right before they pop. 
so I don't get that drift. So keeping them separate and maybe downwind from the prevailing wind is important. <laughs> Having a good like wall of like plants or foliage around or just any kind of block pollen is actually static charge so it actually wants to cling to things and so it's just a lot of like trees or branches and, and or walls like will actually stop a decent amount. Do either of you use the, the biodynamic calendar? Like do you maybe pollinate more often on a flower moon? Have, have you seen that? You use the, uh, the biodynamic calendar? Or, you, or do you use moon? Of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do uh, go by the biodynamic calendar for some things, but for pollination, I haven't done it yet, but maybe I will this year. Cool. <laughs> I have in the past, and this year I slipped a little bit. I wasn't looking at the calendar as much as I usually do. Definitely works for uh, seed starting, I've, I've found out. Like, uh, I planted uh, one of my gardens, I have two 5,000 square foot gardens, and one of them I planted on a root day, and one of them I planted on a flower day. And the ones that I planted on a flower day were, um, just started to shoot up really quick and had no, uh, you know, they weren't just sitting there for a month, where the other garden was actually sitting there for a whole month before they even, like, started growing, so. So, and the whole garden, that whole garden was like predominantly larger than the other one. The, so. the biodynamic calendar, it looks at different astrology and in the, in, in the signs. So a flower is your, is your air signs, your, your Gemini, and your Libra and Aquarius. And so anyway, that's kind of the idea. Just well, part little. of the idea is the pushing and pulling forces too that are happening at a certain moment, like a, a certain variety that's going to have be grown for roots or being grown for a green leaf to eat or for a flower at the end, that um, the pushing and pulling forces that are happening all the time, uh, you know, I mean, we have our tides and everything. There's all these things that are, are uh, affected by these pushes and pulls, but to pay attention to, you know, what the seeds do, Maria Toon did a lot of work on paying attention to radishes and documenting it and just showing that certain days you just get a completely different uh, production. So it's as good to observe, you know, the different days that you crack something and, and write that down and see what, you know, you can learn from it and look what other people had learned from the biodynamic calendar. Yeah, and it can give you a real basic sense of just like how to stay in tune with the moon. Um, you know, so you might make practices that aren't maybe following the exact calendar, but you're at least in tune with how the calendar functions off of the moon cycle. So understanding the greater cosmic cycles uh, gives you a chance to not need to write everything down because your calendar is working with the calendar of nature. So the, the moon is growing, I'm planting seeds. The moon is waning, I'm not planting seeds and I'm harvesting. Um, those are like real general terms that aren't super specific biodynamic, but come from that mentality around how to do things. Are there any more questions here? Yeah? Okay, the, the question that she asked was about the creation of seed banks. It's happening. Uh, anytime you make seeds, you're making a seed bank. Um, I'm a big advocate of everybody making their seed banks and the actual business of seed banks I think needs to be, you know, yeah, like a genetic preservation where you can access open source. That is happening. Yeah, you'll have to look into it. There's definitely people around uh, with those ideas. Um, and, and it's an interesting one, you know, I just say keep your eyes real open on what it's all coming from, but. I would say that the farming community, like this regenerative community, like a lot of the people that you've seen here through the weekend, like that is a seed bank. Like Nick was saying, like breeding, storing seeds, you're storing a seed bank. And these are people that are sharing with each other and creating stuff in the generations. And now it's in multiple different places instead of just one. And I, all of us have some of our genetics in each other's library. And, um, you know, just keeping growing like that, I think is the way to get through it because Stuff like that can get kind of messy sometimes. There's a lot of bureaucracy and sharks and strangeness, but I think the really just keeping it community is a, a really great way to preserve genetics and seeds. 
So yeah, I just want to share a story from our farm this spring and summer. We did um, for the first time at scale of uh, open pollination autoflower seed garden and um, the honeybees just went wild for the male pollen and it was, and they were, their population was stronger all summer and it was just so much fun uh, to witness that happening. I mean, we have, we have a lot of flowers, just, you know, we're dragonfly earth medicine, but the, the, the cannabis pollen, they were swarming for it. And, and also like in my neighborhood, no one does early summer depths, so I didn't have to worry about, you know, messing anybody's stuff up, but it was really beautiful to see that. A lot of times people ask, like, oh, is the honey better from pollen, from the, you know, cannabis, the flower? But it's the nectar that goes into the, the honey. But, but the pollen is a great source. We just had uh, Aiden with, do the regeneration of the honeybee um, and talking about the qualities of pollen. And, like, uh, you know, it's over 50% protein. It energizes you. It's a food source. And you can collect it off bees in the hives when they, like, go into the hive and knock it off. But I'd be kind of curious to eat some cannabis pollen, though. Well, yeah, I actually sent some to... Um the, the company down in LA, um, I've met him. He does like the, and other things, it's like flora wellness. They do like the cannabis aphrodisiac oil and he wanted research for pollen for, you know, like a, a male supplement, you know, pine, I think pine pollen's like what a natural male testosterone booster. And yeah, so I think we'll probably see cannabis pollen as a superfood in, in the future. I think we, I think we have a, a question. Yeah, I just wanted to comment too on uh, something we recently learned together uh, is when we're preserving seeds to not just preserve the seeds but also maybe just like you press a flower, preserve the flower because that when you are thinking of starting a seed bank, if you go to s different types of seed banks, they're going to have a sample of the actual flower that is so you can see the qualities for yourself. So there is ways to press a nug. Yeah, so herbariums are a basis for uh, botany to understand a plant and to know like its morphology and you're actually preserving the genetics. So it's just making a pressing on quality paper, uh, you know, keeping it dry and, and put some weight or pressure onto it. And those get stored in an herbarium, so it's like a resource. Um, but that is a great way to kind of preserve the, the information from something that you're working on. Canador is here and they, uh, that's something that they work on, uh, as well as uh, genetics. Yeah, and then also you could store just uh, making some hash from that, and the hash will store for quite some time, and you can go back and reflect on those flavor profiles later. Do we have any more questions? Yep, in the back. Yeah, yeah. So he's asking about full. You know, yes, he's talking about the the value of making your seeds outdoors with one crop under the natural cycles. Uh, look for it from your breeder. If they're doing that, they should be letting you know because that's the nuance and difference that we need. So I don't know how many people are doing it in that strict of a methodology, but I am, and that's Green Source Garden, so, you know. Um, I try to make available, and I think it's everybody, every farm's responsibility to make available uh, literature trail or information that helps you understand the ethos um, of that farm so you can resonate with something that you believe in and kind of follow that. So as farms producing and in the, in the market, we got to do the best we can to be mission driven and ethically forward and transparent about our practices. And that way you get what you read on the package and not just a bunch of corporate bullshit. Is, do uh, Daniel or Forrest, do you use mixed light at all in your genetics program? Uh, no, but with the uh, Ruderalis, I did something first for the first time this year. I made an F1 uh, and then the F2 in the same summer, which was fun. <laughs> and, uh, and we're also in a, a little bit of a banana belt there. I, last December, I harvested Panama red seeds on the 15th and some other land race stuff in a greenhouse, you know. Um, but no, no mixed light. Yeah, we don't use any mixed light either. Um, I feel like it's really important for all of us to, if we can breed, do it. 
make more seed, share the seed, and uh, I, you know. I do in my in my home grow. I do a a mixed light because I get excited about my new cross, so then I want to plant the seeds right away. So I'm gonna go home from the Emerald <laughs> Cup and plant my seeds and start pheno hunting, and maybe I'll get some cuttings for the for the next season. But yeah, I I will kind of just because I want to see what what the different just what the expression is, and I can only do a few. It's very limited in space, but it's fun. You should tell us a little bit about your cultivation practices and uh, you she dry farms and yeah, tell a little bit about it. Yeah, I, I dry farm. I kind of have this philosophy of do nothing farming and do nothing farming is really based on looking at nature to, to, to guide me in, in what I do. And I don't want to say I'm lazy, but maybe that's a part of it too. But um, I do, I also do a few, I, I make some crosses and yeah, I, I have a, a home grow where I explore some, it's like my research garden. And so I'll do a few things in there and I'll do some, some winter gardening. And it's also temperate, so I don't have to worry about heat and whatnot. I just, but um, yeah, so that's just, I, I've been seeing over time that some, some things do better with the dry farming. When, well, when you first plant, there's some things that will take better. And I also, I don't use like, greenhouses. I just put the plants under the sky and the stars and the rain and and in the nursery phase and I feel that that helps them because they're right next to the garden because the greenhouse adds a lot of different stressors and different things and they start needing more nutrients and so without that they just seem to to grow grow better. But yeah I'm located on the in the Eel River Valley in across from from Shively where there's some amazing dry farmers over there. And uh, my friend Jane from Organic Medicinal, she is the one who turned me on to dry farming. And I just thank her very much for it because it's through that that I really found myself as a farmer. Yeah. And Bill Reynolds, too. Oh, yeah. Bill, Bill Reynolds yeah, was a big... I'm still... I grow all of his veggies, the dark star zucchini and the... Melon and anyway, but we're coming here to the end. You, did you find any varieties that like do better in dry farming? Have you found? Yeah, but they all, everything takes pretty well. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is just getting a natural expression of the land and just seeing what the genetics are with as little inputs and interference on my part. All right, well, we're at the close here. And is there any more closing remarks which you'd like to make? Some closing remarks? Uh, just, yeah, more love, more seeds, you know, power to the people. <laughs> yeah, I can't express enough, like, it really is the most viable seed bank is with us all. And so if we're connected to that source, uh, the future is looking good. But if you're disconnected from that and relying on other people to make all that, um, it, it's, it's not as secure for you. So you can go in this direction where it's like, it doesn't have to be a ton of seed and it doesn't have to be cannabis. It just needs to be this act of participating in humanity that's been doing this for so long. So let's reconnect with our ancient selves and become close to this earth once again and take care of it. Yeah, you know, the, the, this really could be the Garden of Eden. Let's, if, I think we have to clean it up first, though. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah and keep making seed and keep sharing seed. Yeah, thank you. And do things with love. Just do the things that you care about with love. Interact with your community with love. Breed with love. Put that into it. You know, like Luther Burbank was saying, like, it's powerful what, what that can lead to. And it's, 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 like, it's that connection of, of love that it's, it's the guidance of nature and our, and our connection with love that makes this beautiful nature that we're learning from every day. <laughs>